Okay, um, let's start. I'm uh, Morten Johansson. This is Kalle Dinell. Uh, we're architects, and we're running Dinell Johansson, uh, designing uh, everything from from uh, products to to town planning projects. Uh, we were asked to to have a speech to talk about our our attitude. Uh, uh, to sustainability questions within within our practice, um, and being here at the furniture fair and, and talking about sustainability is a little bit, of course, of a contradiction because this is this whole is, event is about overconsumption and overproduction. But uh, we like uh, contradictions and complexity in architecture, so let's give it a try. This is us. We're 27 people. Uh, everyone in the office has uh, nail polish of a specific color, uh, and you paint your nice French pen. This is my pen, my color, summer peach. Uh, it's not a, an idea about sustainability, it's more an idea about kind of loving your pen. The nice thing is everyone is marking their pen and the pens don't disappear. Usually everyone knows that architectural offices are over-consuming these kind of pens. They just, uh, you don't know where they go until you find a bunch at home somewhere. We keep our pens. There, there, there are stories going that someone has, that, that it has happened, that someone has lost their pen and has kind of overpainted the, the back of the pen, but I've, I've, I'm not sure if that really happened. Um, basically, uh, we're saving pens. <laughs> His color is summer peach, my color is hunter. You know, every nail polish has a name. So. And just Which also a little bit uh, talks about the difference of, of character. <laughs> um, but if, we, if we're about to talk about sustainability, this, we, know, we know we have a problem here. Um, and we think the problem is not only overconsumption and overproduction, but it's also about how we look at processes and production processes and efficient production processes. Um, since, since kind of forever, since industrialization, uh, we discovered that if we isolate a process, we can, we can kind of maximize it, we can maximize the output of that process. So all these processes, probably in this picture, are, are a certain number of isolated processes, and each of those processes need to be fed with energy. It takes a lot of energy. And the other problem, of course, is that each process is producing side products. Uh, which are not used in the process, so they waste. Uh, that's, that's a big problem. <laughs> um, and of course, this comes from food production from, from the beginning. Food production is the first industrial production, and the first time uh, kind of the, the processes were isolated from each other. Uh, originally, you would have... Uh, you would have uh, uh, animals uh, not to to eat them, but to produce fertilization for the field where you would where you would produce what you eat and so on. And the byproduct would be milk, which is just a good thing. Obviously, today we know that that uh, meat production is a is a big problem for. Uh, okay, uh, what is this this to do with design? I don't know. Maybe it's just these questions are extremely big. And uh, I think you need, as a designer, you need to be humble. Uh, uh, I think you just need to be aware of this. And maybe not even knowing how to do something about the big question. But maybe there are small questions to do something about. And maybe there is fun also to find. So let's go further back in history. This is fantastic Kyrkultstugan at Skansen. Uh, maybe there is something to find here because uh, life was hard and life was short, but it was sustainable. Uh, and some of the buildings and some of the kind of d products from that time, from actually from Schirkult Stugan, are really inspiring. Uh, very, very smart structure, of course. Come on, PKR. Low building in the middle with the heat and two taller buildings or higher buildings on the side. Obviously, in winter, everyone was would uh, live in this space, very tight, a lot of friction. Uh, 
Uh, you would even take in maybe the, the more uh, clean animals uh, to be used as, as heaters, basically. Um, and these other buildings, you would have a storage for the food which you cannot produce during the winter. And then during the summer, the storage is eaten and instead the family can spread out and, and can, can kind of triple or quadruple the, the space they live in. That's smart. Um, in Kyrkullstugan, you can find this kind of object. It's actually not exactly this one, but there is one like this there. It's a table chair. Uh, I think it's a fantastic object. And uh, also, I think maybe there is a mindset here which is connected to sustainability. Uh, basically, you use energy and resources to produce one thing, so you should be able to use it for at least two things. That seems smart. And it, that needs to be repeated almost. That's the whole point <laughs> with this uh, lecture. It's your turn. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, um, on our way here, we started talking about how, how long time ago this was. Uh, Morten visited me in Japan, and it's almost 20 years ago. And a little bit also the starting point of our collaboration. And after that, we started working together as employees. But uh, since uh, six years back, we have our office. I was then a student in um, the same laboratory as Elsa's was as I sitting here. Um, we were not, not there at the same time. I was there before you, I think. Um, at Tsukamoto uh, Bauau uh, Lab, and um, I got the um, oppor opportunity to be part of this, uh, their first book, which is called Made in Tokyo. It's about uh, uh, the complex uh, city, the complexity of the city of Tokyo, and how spaces interact, different spaces interact. Um, uh, it's, it, it's not about architecture, it's about what, what happens in the city when the city becomes very intense and, and the lack of space is very, how do you say, present. Um, so I would just like to show you, to illustrate a little bit uh, our, our uh, interest in, in um, hybridity or uh, 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 programmatic uh, sustainability, I would say. As a, you, you, you do one thing, uh, you have the task to do one thing, but you end up doing more than one thing uh, through these buildings. An example is the interchange court. Uh, it's uh, the uh, le leftover space in the traffic interchange which has also been um, developed later on as a tennis court. So there's a lot of uh, 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 interesting cases like that in, in uh, Japan. Uh, some of them are more fun than others and, uh, or absurd. This is a graveyard tunnel. So it's not only a graveyard. There is also a um, uh, highway passing through the graveyard. You could imagine that trip going under the graveyard. It's, uh, the, it was also called, called the ghost tunnel, of course. Mm -hmm. So, funny. Uh, colliding spaces. This is, uh, if you've been to Japan, maybe you're familiar with Akihabara, which is the, uh, in Tokyo the, where you buy your, all your uh, electronics, the gadgets. Uh, this is where all the young people go and hang out or at least used to do, I don't know now. Uh, uh, the city, ne just next to the train station where all the people uh, arrive, city designed not only a um, skateboard park, was it, it's called Vampire Park, this one. Uh, they designed a skateboard park to attract the young people coming to Akihabara to stay a little bit, but also Inside the skateboard park is a blood donor station, as a blue Jiva Central. So you get the fresh blood from the young people <laughs> while they go skateboarding. Uh, it was all about documenting these kind of uh, collisions and friction in the city. Um, uh, if you've been to Tokyo, you've seen this. You have the right to put up uh, a vending machine on your, on your plot. So um, 
this was one of the first, uh, but you can even see houses being all cladded with vending machines. So you use your house as uh, an infrastructure for something else. Oh, shooting graveyard, also a kind of strange combination. Uh, you have this shooting right there. range, range uh, inside a graveyard. Is this me? Huh? Yeah, that's you. It's me. <laughs> We're talking a little bit about our office and how we uh, work. Um, we have an office on Olofsgatan in Stockholm. It's very close to Hörtorget, very in the city center. Um, we've been attached to this local ever s uh, since we started si five years ago. Um, what? Nu ska vi se. How do I do this? Oh, fun. There. Uh, mot, uh, peka. Uh, and there. there. Yeah. Okay, so here's the street. And uh, our local goes in very deep like this. Our office space. I wanted to show this uh, because we told you we would talk about friction and add-ons and programmatic um, uh, combinations. Uh, we have Still today, this is our office space. We have a little bit more upstairs. The, uh, the two office spaces are not connected internally. There is no stair connecting. So we go through our um, small office downstairs, out on the street, and then we go inside the, the, um, the other house, and upstairs we have another space. But very interesting, still working. We have a meeting room as a first space from uh, entering the street. So you meet, uh, the meeting room is also a passage. So, all, all, um, we have, oh, okay, sorry. It's a combination of spaces. Oh, but the funny thing is, I think I have it there. There it is. The funny thing with this is, um, which we basically discovered, th uh, discovered through this, one of the most important, thi uh, important things with a me having a meeting is that everyone is really relaxed. <laughs> um, that that you kind of get rid of formal formality. And it's totally impossible to be formal in this space because you will get the door coming up <laughs> to your chair and you will have to you know, move along when someone is passing through the meeting room. And it really works. You could think someone would be annoyed by it, but it's, it's the opposite. It's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. It really works. <gasps> So here's a view from inside, you have the street outside, the meeting room is in between there. Um. Okay, Morten told me I have way too many slides on this one, so let's go on. Uh, we had a task, very early task, uh, five years ago. We, we, the task was to investigate the relationship between these three spaces in Stockholm. It's uh, Björn Stregård, uh, Fatbursparken and in the middle, Medborgarplatsen. Uh, we got the opportunity to uh, investigate very freely, to look into this, uh, these different spaces, how they work. We were looking a little bit uh, like um, we showed you the Made in Tokyo study, after uh, collisions between... There is a lot of collision here. You, have you been here? Uh, yeah, if you've been here, you know there is a, it's uh, very crowded. I think Björn Stregor is one of the most uh, used spaces in Stockholm. Um, so there was um, numbers of different... Uh, interesting, what do you say, iakttagelser, um, things happening there that we collected in different ways here. And then we got the task to do um, uh, like a summer project to illustrate uh, what we found and how, I, th I think the task was to try things out. What, could, what is needed in Medborgarplatsen? What could we add? to Medborgarplatsen. Uh, there is absolutely no green in Medborgarplatsen. It's totally a uh, uh, hard space. Um, it's an urban... Uh, but the, uh, we found things showing that maybe there could be a need for green. Another thing we noticed is, if you've been to Medborgarplatsen, you have it's kind of shaded by Medborgarhuset. 
the big building. Uh, on the other side, where you have sun, opposite of Medborgplatsen, it's all uteserveringar, and you need to be 18 or older in order to get into the sun space, and you need to or order a drink. Uh, so it's kind of occupied. It's not. It's maybe paradise found or maybe uh, paradise lost for most of the people. It's like, oh, not very public. The uh, very funny name of that club was Ojo Ojo, and uh, I don't know if it was a club in the club, but it was Ade Hode. It's kind of occupied. Okay, need for sun. Uh, we had this. Uh, mm, mm, very clear um, conclusion that we need to do something about the sun and the, uh, how can the uh, rest of the people get, get part of this sun. There's, it's a monumental shadow uh, over these spaces. Also in Fatbush Park, and you have this huge building casting shadow over the park. Uh, the no other building casting shadow is the Medborgar Huset that I told you about. Um, it has a very clear resemblance to uh, the temple in Luxor. Uh, at least we wanted to see that. Uh, maybe you can see that. And people, we love sun. We love hanging in the... Uh, have you been to Hertory? This is next to our office. It's a big stair there. People gather and it's always full of people as soon as the sun uh, comes out. So we looked back to that culture, you know, the. Egyptian culture and ask them, what did you do? We made a sun stair. So we made, uh, we designed the sun as a summer project in Melbourne Plaza. And we designed this sun uh, uh, stair, sun, sol trappa. And of course, uh, adding that uh, tree, giving some green to the space. That was the first skiss. And that was when it was built. I became super popular, of course, it was something happening there, and uh, we designed some tree pots, seat, sitting, and, and, and greenery, all, all the time, the two, combination of the two. Uh, we also used, there's an ice hockey ring um, in the winter time, we used that space, kept it, and uh, we put uh, Grass. We put grass there, and it was enough to stimulate a series of events. Uh, we call Egen controllers when you do your uh, drawing, you have to control them. Morten is a very good football player, so he did his Egen control, and there was a lot of fun things going on that summer. But it ended up with an extremely symbolic act, a square dance. As a, this is a square, so uh, the square dance act was very funny to see, you know those uh, following the pattern of the square. Oh, just, uh, that's, uh, after that, we, we've been working with uh, quite a few projects for Stockholm City, uh, or the city of, the city of Stockholm. Um, with m kind of minor interventions, minor urban in interventions. This was, uh, we were asked to design um, bicycle parking at the, um, uh, at the central station in Stockholm. Uh, this is the site. We have the central station here, the tracks going in. Uh, very interesting place, maybe you know it. Uh, it's it's really right under the whole traffic apparatus here, the whole uh, highway system. So it's it's not a very you know nice space to to be. But there is something really interesting here, which is we have the main street of Vasagatan here, which is obviously a very important street, uh, and this part of the of the highway or whatever you uh, want to call it is actually connected to the small street of Vattugatan, which goes all the way up to, to uh, uh, Berunkeberg's Torg. Old street from the old kind of city fabric. Uh, but, but it really dissolves here. Vattugatan dissolves totally. There is a small staircase here, which almost no one uses. But the idea then, of course, was if we do a bicycle parking here, we should 
connect the two levels. We should definitely connect Vasagatan with Vattagatan. So it's a broad ramp, and you park in the ramp, but you can also just, you know, why do you commute? You can just uh, change level and, and come from, from Vattagatan and take your way down to Vasagatan. So cycle parking and urban connection. You can see the ramp coming up here to Vattagatan, and then you have the, the parking here. Um, but because of these projects, we also have been asked by, by private clients to, to do small urban connections because, um, because also the private clients have understood how, how these kind of uh, interventions can, can uh, define a place and how that actually rises the value of that place. Um, this is Solna Strand, formerly known as Vreten. Um, originally an a area with uh, light industries. Now it's an area of, of uh, office buildings. And the ambition of, of the property owners here and also partly of the city of, of uh, Solna is to, uh, to develop this area to be a, um, a kind of a multi-use living uh, urban environment. Uh, whereas now it's mostly offices. And to do that, you, you would need to uh, have housing in the area. Uh, and that will come, and they will develop it in that direction, but, but uh, obviously it takes time. In the meantime, uh, they want to have a nice atmosphere, of course, in the area. This is the place where you get up from the metro station, and the first thing you see is uh, uh, electricity a trans transformer substation. And the, the property owners here around think it's, it's, a, it's a pity that this building is the first thing you see. And usually there is a lot of uh, graffiti on it and so on. So they asked us, what can we do with this building? How can we, how can we, how can we do it nicer? How can we do some kind of uh, intervention? Again, of course, for us, it's not that interesting just to come up with an ornament. But we wanted to, to give it a use. And as there is a shortage of housing in the area, uh, but housing for people uh, will not come yet because that requires planning, we can do housing for birds in the meantime. So this is all going to be cladded with uh, birds' houses. Uh, very interesting to talk to the ornithologists about sizes of, of bird houses and, and what kind of birds we could have here. One, uh, what is it? Rovfågel, raptor. You can only have one, <laughs> but you can have one. So this is the cat Uggleholk. Ah, that's the one. And then a lot of uh, other birds' houses for smaller birds, also insects. And this is very similar. Uh, we were asked to design a new public toilet for Stockholm um, by a company that wanted to, what's uh, name? Airbuda wanted to deliver these toilets uh, to Stockholm, uh, and they already had a developed product called Phoenix. This is funny because this is also a story about birds. Um, this model they had called Phoenix. Um, uh, top-of-the-line uh, automated uh, toilet, prefabricated, uh, cladded on the outside with a, with a skin of, of glass, and in the evening it was lit. But the, the, the officials of Stockholm uh, said they, they didn't want to have this design. They wanted to have something which was specific for Stockholm. So basically our task was to, to redo the, the, cl the cladding of this toilet. Um, Phoenix to us seemed a little bit hard. <laughs> the kind of the bird, the, the bird of fire. Uh, we thought we wanted to do something more friendly for Stockholm, something more pavilion-like. So we, we call it Luri instead. It's, it's a Luri bird. It's a kind of parrot. You know Luris? <laughs> They're very colorf colorful, much more playful. Phoenix, a little bit scary. 
Luri very friendly. <laughs> More like this, maybe. This Koppartelten uh, um, in Haga Parken. Uh, very, very strange, very fantastic kind of architecture, we think. Uh, pavilion architecture. Okay, but again, it's about uh, finding uh, multiple functions. So we kind of thought about who's, who's going to use this. Uh, it's not only people, but we, we have we have people of all ages with all kind of uh, situations in life. We have dogs, we have birds, we have insects. And, and what do the, these people need? There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of needs besides going to the toilet. The concept was to clad uh, the toilet with panels, uh, which, which were uh, of a certain size and, and exchangeable. And these panels could have uh, different colors, but basically also different functions. You could have a seat or you could have a a waste basket or you can have an insect net, uh, insect um, house or, or whatever. That's a panel. Trying, the idea was that it should be this easy to exchange a panel, either if it's destroyed or you, you come up with a new function for a specific place. This is uh, the only one which is built of these uh, in this shape yeah, at Humle Gordon. Uh, being in, in this park environment, uh, so every second panel is, is mirroring the park, so it really kind of blends in. We have a drinking fountain here, which to us was kind of the fantastic uh, function because there is water, and uh, all the drinking fountains which, which you used to have in Stockholm are, are closed sin since long. But there is also this. This is the bumblebee nest, um, because the toilet stands in Humle Gordon, where Humle Gordon doesn't really, it's not really bumblebee, but it doesn't matter, it's funny. I like to see uh, Humle Gordon as Humle, uh, bumblebee, but it's not. <laughs> the story becomes a lot better. Uh, uh, we, uh, before, when we put these projects together, we had this idea, because if you work, uh, uh, in an office like we've done for five years, every, everything seems to be connected. All the projects are connected somehow, through clients or uh, friends or type of project. It's like strangely, strange mix of people and, and, and projects. So they are actually put together and um, the relationship between this and the last one is it's just across the street. It's a Taverna Brillo uh, restaurant that we worked on for a very, very long time and um, made, I don't know how many hundreds of drawings together with um, Jonas Bolin, uh, interior designer that most of you might know about if you're in this fair, uh, close friend and collaborator with us. Uh, so we did Taverna Brillo. The interesting thing about Taverna Brillo, uh, speaking about this context, um, is the idea of, here you have um, Sturegatan, and here is the uh, connection with Humlegårdsgatan. It was a combination of spaces from different properties, uh, extremely complex, uh, and this space, this used to be a courtyard when we came, uh, so this one was belonging to this entrance, and this was also a courtyard, and there was a small shop facing Humlegårdsgata. So what we did here was we connected these courtyard spaces with the former shops, and we got a, an L-shaped restaurant shape. The very interesting was, thing was then the two entrances from Sturegata and Humlegårdsgata. And we decided early on to build the whole concept uh, um, with the idea of making a trottoir, trottoir, pavement. So there is this pavement connecting the two and creating this space, having the idea that this should be a space for everybody and you should feel it and um, experience it as a public space. So to enforce that we, uh, here's the pavement. It's a wooden pavement, has a very strong characteristic sound when you walk on it and everything is arranged around this pavement as uh, outdoor 
seating, also ute uh, servering standard. We brought in uh, artist Nug for the graffiti here, and ah, it's grouped as small pavilions along this in the greenhouse. Now a very strange connection here, a very good connection to the next project. The owner of Taverna Brillo is um, uh, a, a big restaurant, uh, Krögare. Uh, he owns not only that restaurant, but some others in, in, in Stockholm. He is also... Um, head of the football club uh, in Lidingö. Since he used to live there and have his own kids playing football, he finally became, uh, as ev every club is built up on um, Ideella. Mm. Ideella? I don't know. Mm. Ideella Krafter. You need to be engaged in your, um, your society, uh, in your community. He was. And he became uh, ordförande, head of that club. He then asked us when we were running around this plot, me and Morten, do you know anyone who happens to live, and he says, on the island, <laughs> having kids, playing football, being an architect? <laughs> and we said, we don't live there, but uh, this was five years ago, and we wanted to do everything. So we said, but we can help you. Then he came the next day, said, oh, we need to build a clubhouse. And, and uh, we started, we had one or two weeks to do the first skis. And, oh yeah, I don't know, that was the connection. <laughs> Here's PG. We visited the site and they wanted a clubhouse for leading a football club, all the kids to hang out and for the offices of the club to be. Uh, again, we did ask ourselves, what can we do? more than a clubhouse. Investing all this money into a building, could it serve any other functions? So uh, we decided to do the triangular section and um, combine it with um, the seating for spectators and uh, uh, doing this section. Uh, it further on became more than a clubhouse. It became uh, Hem Vista. Oh as a hangout for the kids, a cafeteria, an important room for the kids. Uh, the brief was, was it needs to be a space not only for, for football playing kids, but for all the kids on the island to meet up. It became locker rooms, and a rather tall building divided into two, with the locker rooms in one and uh, the cafeteria and the uh, uh, office of the club in the other. We've always said that our whole business uh, has one uh, more a goal, is to <laughs> come as, as close as possible to this man. So we felt here, oh, shit is happening. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, we haven't met him yet. No. no. Uh, it was a long process, uh, of course, to make a building. Uh, trying to convince, uh, need to convince the city of doing, uh, approving this. I think the model was very important in this sense. Uh, the city became very happy and we started building. Uh, it became very much like the first skis we had with the triangular section. The whole composition is based upon the hexagon of the football. You know, the le old leather football has uh, that hexagon as a geometrical pattern. So everything is uh, built up on that. The, what you see here is then the seatings grouping around. In between those, you have the metal staircases. Oh. Um, These early pictures from when it was really new, so it looks a little bit shitty around. But you remember that first illustration, it's very much the same. And also on the back, you have this low budget fa facade cladded with the spalier following the hexagon pattern. It's a big success and 
this is when we got a nice prize from the city of Lidingö. Uh, and what we do now is that we use this building as ours once, one day a year. We, we gather colleagues and we have a football tournament. Uh, I am speaking about this, but he's the football nerd. <laughs> Uh, so this is your initiative, and it's super fun. So every June, mid-June, beginning June, we do this uh, uh, summer of Slutning with colleagues. To this year, how many? How many teams? All oh, 24. 24 probably. teams. Hopefully now we are joining the Koti Ho also, mm -hmm. student team. And this is Morten and <laughs> Constance, and they're uh, competing here against White. And here we can see, I, I saw someone there, yeah, Vari Architecture with the wolf. Everyone printed their own T-shirts. It's very, very competitive, I would say. We never won. We never even moved on to Slutspel, did we? No. No, no, no. Did Vari, did you? Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. White was really hard this year. They have a professional football player in their office. Okay. Tvätt uh, machine. It's a building in in. Uh, did I put? Yeah, in Breading. We have a um, strong relationship with one a builder, a hyresrätt uh, builder, uh, in Stockholm, and um, they they have a big, um, a large amount of apartments in Breading in these houses here. Uh, and uh, they needed uh, to develop a new um, threat studio. What's that? Uh, washing machine space for, for the people living there because they got rid of their old one. Uh, interesting, uh, this, this is uh, Breading is uh, said to be the first um, million program project in Sweden. It's built then in the early 60s. And uh, at that time, when you planned the Tvetstuga, was really important as a functional space. In uh, where, where it was designed very largely designed and, and a space where you should gather and hang out, not only wash your clothes. It was a social space. Didn't really work out that way. Uh, it's not our thing to hang out doing laundry. Uh, but uh, uh, throughout the years, when now when we come into this space, it's actually not dominated by, by us, the Swedes. It's not the Swedes living here. The people living here, they actually use the Tvetstuga as a social space. They hang out, they hang out, and they wash together. So, uh, again, uh, that would be the brief for our, our Tvetstuga. Not only a uh, Tvetstuga, but uh, a space to, to, for those people to, to um, work, uh, to be in. So it was, it's placed in between those houses on these huge parking lots. Um, um, we redefined the parking lots and made it more of a um, place uh, to be. We designed the very narrow Tvetstuga uh, here uh, in the very end of the parking lot facing the park in the north with a big window in the end, big window in the beginning, a small uh, plaza in front where you can meet up and, 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 and uh, sit. Uh, small spaces uh, here and here, very important. Uh, bookshelves in the uh, windows. Uh, oh, sorry, only here now. Um, for uh, trading stuff. Uh, not, not only trading books, but uh, as a trading, byta, exchange stuff. So you bring your things and... Uh, we designed it as a, a machine, a factory. We call it the Tvet machine, the washing machine. So it has this uh, machine roof. It has, oh, uh, the brick is uh, the sa exactly the same brick we managed to find. They have used in, it exists in, in those buildings, the entrances. Not so much, but they exist. So that's why we have this brick. Uh, Mm, very nice space. We often misname this. I was going misname. We call it, but accidentally, we, we, when we talk about it, we call it the church because it, it's almost like a church. I don't know if you're familiar with a uh, church in Finland uh, by Sirian. 
which has a big window and the cross is not inside, but it's actually outside in the nature, standing outside of the building. So, so uh, we ha this picture, I said, we need to take a picture before all the machines come to play so we can uh, put this cross outside. Uh, we never did that, actually. And uh, I thought really the space would be at, at its best without the machines, but really with the machines it's fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> I think it's one of the most expensive Tvets Duger ever Probably. built. But fantastic. And of course, uh, the most worked on piece in this Tvets Duger is the only concrete element it has. It carries a frieze facing the park. Uh, molded in the concrete, we have the washing symbols in a classic way. And here you see the small plaza in front. I think it's, I'm very proud, it's a little bit heroic, this building. So it's Are we, we're going to hurry up here because I think we have five minutes left only, so this is going to go fast. It's the same client and it's the same playfulness. Uh, here it's about a, a, a structure, uh, um, um, a concrete structure. It's built with uh, sandwich, sandwich concrete elements, which you then can mold into a what is it, matrix to get any shape. Uh, this is the what is the first school now? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. So basically, this is. Uh, a pegboard in scale 10 to 1. Pegboard? Pearls? Okay. This no, is my no. son yeah, putting pegboard. in the, mm -hmm. the pegs, which here are, are aluminum. It's, it's, a, it's a cutted aluminum tube. Fantastic tube, this thick. Uh, and then they're painted. And this is how it is on site. And the idea is that every class of five-year-olds who are leaving the kindergarten to go to school are going to do the design of the next one. And in the end, this whole courtyard will be filled with different pegboards. That's very funny, we think. No, yeah, yeah. This is another part of the same building, where it's not pegboards, but aluminum panels. OK. Also important that you say it's developed really with Primula, and, and their chief architect at that time was Tour Leif Falk. Yes, yes, oh. we should say that. Do you have the last one also? Yes. <laughs> and that one is important. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is in the same area, uh, Norge and, and and this is basically the only project you've seen today, which is, which is specifically a project about sustainable techniques and s sustainable building. Um, it was a, um, a competition. Uh, we won with uh, Stockholm's Hem, a uh, builder, um, uh, communal builder uh, for a house for housing uh, which generates more energy than it than it uh, uses over over one year so it's a plus energy house basically we're back to uh, some of the first pictures the smartness in in having a flexible living space which is smaller during the winter and bigger during the summer um, there's a lot of those spaces also, not only, not only maybe in this kind of classical Swedish housing, but also later where you have these kind of spaces, the glass veranda, which you don't use during the winter because it's too cold, but it's a fantastic living space during the summer. So basically the idea was to have really tight apartments. Uh, during winter you would have a a functional but really tight apartment and then during summer it would expand into a zone uh, and you would kind of eight eight months a year you would have a substantially bigger apartment which is shaped into this veranda structure outside of outside of the building this kind of space we think is is uh, fantastic and obviously it's it's smart uh, because it's a it's a climate buffer basically 
the next thing then is uh, how to, because by doing that, we're kind of uh, saving uh, energy and we're kind of passively collecting solar energy, but we're not producing electricity. Uh, so the, the, the building needed to be smart in other ways also. This was the plan uh, which uh, was already there uh, to, to, to volumes in this way, one five stories, one six stories. Um, we put a roof on it because uh, if you have a 30, 30 degrees leaning roof, then you can really use it for solar cells. Even better, if the solar cells are um, directed right to the south. So we vred på nocken, basically, to make these roof, area, uh, roof um, areas, um, optimize them for, for producing solar energy. And here you can see also the, these, um, these veranda spaces. This is how it looks. This is how how uh, how how the the comp uh, competition entry looked at least, <laughs> and it's going to look something like it. And obviously, it's been a uh, a very interesting process how to make this happen. It's much easier to make it up than to you know in your head than to build it for real. But it's going to be something very similar to this. This is seen from the water. And this is a little bit describing uh, what we then think is like, like we've been talking about all the time. It's not only technical, technical stuff here with with uh, 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 heat exchanging of, of all the used water and all the used air and things, but it's also being smart about those spaces, making them uh, with double use, so you can so you can kind of get the maximum quality of life, basically, out of that. This is the, the typical plan from one of the buildings. You see it's a very, very simple plan. Very, very simple. You have just the, the uh, bedrooms lined up, and you have a, a uh, kitchen and, and uh, living room like this. And each of these rooms are expanding out in the veranda. Um, to not make this, usually you don't, you don't want to have this kind of corridor in, a, in an apartment, uh, also because it gets dark. Well, then we've introduced these very simple ideas about having, having wind or having a, a glass above uh, all doors, so you, so you actually get the daylight as, as far in, uh, in, the, in the apartment as possible. Uh, this is kitchen and living room, and you can see the veranda out here. And the veranda then, which is much, much bigger than a normal balcony, uh, um, the idea is then to be, to be able to use it for all kinds of stuff. Uh, so there will be, uh, there will be uh, a possibility to hang your bike there, fixed on the wall. Um, there was, at least in the competition entry, the idea of that you could could have small-scale farming, or even if you would just put flowers uh, recessed in, in the floor of the terrace. Um, there will be um, hooks on the walls of, of at the veranda, so you could you know, ha hang up your tools, which you might want to use for whatever you do on the veranda. And then the detailing, we think, is funny and important uh, design-wise. So the veranda is, is uh, the load-bearing structure uh, all in the end will not be out of wood, <laughs> but will still be cladded with wood. Here it was wood, and the, the connection was shaped like this plus, as it is a plus energy house. Water is reused for the planting, and uh, again we have the Tvetstuga because we think it's a very interesting space. Uh, it's so boring when it's just a technical space where you have to wash your clothes and you hate to go to the Tvetstuga. But it's so nice if it, if it becomes in a social space just by the entrance with a big glass outside and you can sit outside on a nice bench while, while you're waiting for your, your clothes to be washed. Last thing, uh, which will not happen, uh, we're very sad about that, um, was a part of the kind of garden design to the building. Kind of two-story pergola, 
with stuffed with uh, different functions. Uh, you would have meeting places, but you would have the possibility to um, uh, garden or farm. Uh, there were beehives up here, a playing house and, and bicycle parking and, and a place to put your plants when you're going away in summer. You would put them here so they get rainwater or even maybe a friendly neighbor will give them water. Uh, basically, this. Um, <laughs> And we, maybe we would like to finish off with uh, saying, I think as a designer, you need to be extremely humble. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't say we're, we're kind of saving the world by design. Um, but we can, we, can be, we can be inspired by smart things. And we can believe in that this kind of smartness probably is part of a sustainable attitude. Uh, that's it. Thank you.